Yeah. I just wonder if you have been a little unfair to socialists who are not communists. I refer to your comment about Michael Barrington, for example. It, it seemed to suggest that, they were, that he and others like him uh, were, were soft on communism. They, did, they, they didn't have a feel for the nature of communism. In there. There's so many people who are so clearly identified, who are, have been and are social democrats, who are clearly identified as vehement anti-communists, going back Norman Thomas and Albert Shanker and, and many other people. It just seems to me that the comment about Harrington leaves an impression that it seems to me is not, is not fully accurate. Well, in fact, I will defend my comment in the following way. The problem I came to see with that, the organization I was a part of, Democratic Socialists of America and Harrington particularly, is that Mike Harrington and even Irving Howe, who was indeed, as you described him in an earlier period, moving very far to the left and resurrecting illusions that you least expect they would be coming up with. I mean, if I take Irving Howe's counterpart in Latin America was the great essayist, the late Octavio Paz, who was a close friend of how you read Howe's Paz's essays on Nicaragua and the Sandinistas, he was forthright in condemnation of them as a totalitarian state being supported by the Soviet Union. Irving Howe believed he was still searching for a new independent third force, and against all evidence, he would say there's something different and they had to be supported. They also had the problem is they were consciously merging with the new left an old left remnant group, the New American Movement, into a new organization. And they were moving to the far left. And in fact, getting rid of all those kind of attitudes they once had. Uh, so that their response in uh, not wanting to give me blurbs on the Rosenberg file, which certainly could have been divorced from an organizational question, uh, was very typical. I mean, I think they were actually moving very far to the left and abandoning any critical position they once had. Can you extrapolate to the present? Where do you think is a left over left right now? <laughs> well, where's the most of the institutions now? Uh, everybody has commented the, the current left is a gobbledygook as. You know, it was either in the Times, Paul Krugman or Thomas Friedman who said they should call themselves the coalition to keep the world's poor poor. I mean, these are people against economic growth, against capitalism, against uh, economic development, who see, they don't, in a sense, somebody, I think some conservative, I just read an editorial last week, I forget which columnist was, said, uh, gee, if this is the new left, give me the old left, because the old left at least had a vision, they had a different society they believed would replace the one that existed. These people don't even have a vision or a goal. They're just against. They're against the United States. They see the United States as the empire. They call themselves anarchists. Uh, they're for violence. Uh, they're... Uh, against free trade, they're against globalization. They're like the modern equivalent of the Luddites. They want to stop a process going on in the world that really is irreversible. Uh, and they don't even understand. You, I mean, at some levels, there are some decent elements on them. I can sympathize uh, with the young people who, for example, are very upset over sweatshops in third world countries. The sentiment behind that is noble. But if you look at the economic reality, as people have pointed out over and over again, it's sweatshops or no shops. So these are people who once, in that one campaign where they won their way, the shops closed down and they're even worse servitude and worse economic conditions than, when, than they were before. Sweatshops only eventually ended in this society when we got to an industrial stage where that could be accomplished. There has to be economic growth and development. And I think this, this current left is living in a fictional world. I think part of it is per you're always going to have perpetual adolescent rebellion where these people uh, just go off the deep end and have a fierce passion, and there's little thought behind it. I mean, some of it is really scary when you read the things coming out of their mouths. Uh, but they're not going to go anywhere. They can be very disruptive, and they can have a very damaging role, unfortunately. Uh, and I don't know, I haven't seen, obviously, the news today, but there were actions being planned 
uh, all through London, uh, some in this country, they're supposed to set off fire alarms in cities, things like that, just to cause disruption for the sake of disruption. Uh, you anything? Yeah. Oh, all right. It doesn't. You were very lucky that your first trip to Utopia was Cuba in terms of your later life, because apparently they did a very bad job of, of uh, handling you. The Soviet Union was far more skillful at this. Paul Hollander documents dozens, hundreds of famous artists and intellectuals in the 20s, 30s, and 40s who went to the Soviet Union, were given show, shows, and came back just even more enthusiastic. The most famous one, of course, was when the Vice President of the United States, Henry Wallace, went to Siberia in 1944 at the direction of Franklin Roosevelt with his companion Owen Lattimore and ended up in Colima, which they came back and wrote up as equivalent to the TVA. as one of the most marvelous things they experiences they'd ever had. And Wallace wrote it up in his book and Owen Lattimore wrote it up in the National Geographic, showed pictures of the, of the gay payu agents who were not gay payu agents during that particular period. So they handled it very differently had you gone that way you might not have ended up where you are now. But the thing is, I was, a, uh, I was the only one in this group of 12. I was really the only one. All the other members of the group, it had that effect on them. Uh, I mean, they were so committed beforehand, as I said, you know, I'll stand up because I can't see any of you, but they couldn't uh, see. They were just so bamboozled and so full of stars in their eyes that it didn't matter what they, they saw what they wanted to see. Uh, it, they didn't need a Potemkin village, it was in their minds, so the reality didn't matter. Yeah. Continuing on that thought, uh, you mentioned a lot of people, like Suzanne Ross and some of the others. Apparently it was their teachers who had the greatest effect on them, and even today most of the old left is ensconced in universities. And my question would be, have you, what have you seen on the effects of the Venona paper and John Haynes's work on the Communist International Files, which shows Harry, Harry Bridges was a, an agent long before they ever suspected? In terms of history being taught today on the universities, have, have they caught up to the truth, or are they still putting out the left still putting out the mess? Well, John is here today. Should I have him answer that? But uh, where are you, John? Uh, you want to say something? Since you've been dealing with this and writing on this. Well, actually, Ron, you know, your, your own essays on front page on, on the AHA and the OAH, I think, speak to that rather directly. So why don't you talk about that? On, uh, well, it, it does, there was, no, yeah, I, I write a weekly column for frontpagemag.com, and uh, <coughs> two of my previous columns in the past few weeks were on the, the presidents of the two historical organizations, Eric Foner, president of the American Historical Association, and David Montgomery, president of the Organization of American Historians. Both of them are very much old line Marxists teaching and propagating a, a new, seemingly more sophisticated version of old left history. Uh, and to see my argument and summary of what they said in my comments, you, you can look that up on the, uh, the article on the website. But in terms of Venona, which I thought John would, it, the fact is that uh, you have scores of books coming out in which uh, the true believers are trying to create new articles to say that Venona doesn't prove anything. Most recently, you probably all know from the newspaper accounts, NYU Tamimit Library, and ironically, Tamimit Institute, somebody who was once one of the great names of anti-communist liberalism, the Tamimit Institute, now run out of NYU and controlled by old, pro new younger pro-communist leftist, has put up the official Alger Hiss website dedicated to proving Alger Hiss's innocence and is attempting to fill it with documents of proof showing that all this stuff that Hiss and others were guilty is not true. Uh, so that these people are never going to stop. Uh, I mean, they're going to go, you know, Eric Foner, uh, was really, I'll be frank, an arch nemesis of mine. I mean, uh, uh, has been attacking the Rosenberg file since it came out. He, he wrote the introduction to the Rosenberg's kids' new edition of their book uh, called We Are Your Sons, and in his introduction, which came out a few years ago, he says the Rosenberg case was about the suppression of civil liberties in order to uh, quash a, 
uh, forthcoming peace movement. Well, you know, the Rosenberg case wasn't about the crushing of civil liberties. It was a case involving Soviet espionage. And this is the president of the American Historical Association speaking, one of the most distinguished historians in the country who holds a chair in history at Columbia University. Uh, so that, it's true, these people are in the academy, and no matter what happens outside the academy, I think the American Academy, per se, is almost finished. It's corrupt. Uh, it's the people teaching it, the stuff they put out is putrid, and they keep turning out stuff like this. Um, yes, you were raising. Um, there seems to be an inability on the part of a younger generation of conservatives to differentiate between the old left and the new left because we're not as familiar with the history as you are because we haven't lived through it. So. How would you encapsulate the the essential differences between, like the distinguishing characteristics of the old left and the new left in a broad sort okay. of Okay, the old left really is the generation of the 1930s, who came out of the effort to organize the CIO, the Industrial Trade Union Movement. They were communists and socialists, or Trotskyists. They were one or another variety of Marxist-Leninists, some pro-Soviet, believing the Soviet Union was the socialist paradise, the others believing uh, the Soviet Union and Stalin had betrayed the revolution, but they all spoke in the common framework of belief in what they thought was the science of Marxism to create a new socialist society that would replace the capitalist society through some kind of social revolution. Uh, the new left started in the 1960s. And what most of the people don't realize, but if you do, if you read the thing, is that the new left, whose basic manifesto was the famous one written in the, the Port Huron Statement, written by Tom Hayden, which exemplified, in a new style language, it coined phrases like participatory democracy and the need to oppose the corporations. But you have to realize that these were most of the people in the new left, the largest organization of which became Students for a Democratic Society, the key people in it were really children of the old left. Virtually all the former red diaper babies I knew all ended up in SDS, or if they were a little older, in the affiliated young adult movement for a democratic society. And they still had the same outlook. Uh, they still believed, essentially, that the enemy of the world's people was the United States. And to quote two prototypical great new leftists of the time, Tom Hayden and his associate Staunton Lind, who was then a Yale University historian, later became a labor lawyer working in Michigan, they wrote an article on studies in the left in which they said, quote, this is frankly verbatim, anti-communism is the moral equivalent of rape. Uh, there, and remember, it's Tom Hayden and Staunton Lind, the two major leaders of the New Left, who went with the communist historian Herbert Aptheker to Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And it was Tom Hayden who came back saying the Viet Cong had produced a new rice roots democracy. So that uh, the New Leftists believed in so they were something new, but they were carrying along the tradition and the myths to a later generation. And that's why, surprisingly, the people I quoted, like Mark Nason, was of the new left generation, not, I think, from an old left family. So many of them, in the history they are doing now, and a lot of them, in fact, became historians, not just academics. The whole new school of pro-communist history, there's a whole scholarly community dedicated to rehabilitating American communism in the history books. They're all made up of people who are active new leftists. And there is that direct link there. Um, and of course, there's also another link between the democratic early new left and the violent new left of the later period. You have to remember that even the, the weather underground came out of SDS, and they were the most violent. They believed the revolution, the country was in the urge of the eve of revolution, and they had to und und undertake bombings, terrorist acts, even murder, bank robbery, and so forth to finance the revolution. Uh, and a lot of them, like uh, 
Kathy Boudin. Kathy Boudin is still in prison, was the uh, daughter of a labor and civil liberties lawyer, Leonard Boudin, who, of course, was part of the same old pro-National Lawyers Guild, pro-communist left community. Uh, one of the people who called me up long distance, it was her call, so I wasn't that upset, was another old friend of mine from Camp Woodland, Joni Rabinowitz, whose father was Victor Rabinowitz, Leonard Boudin's partner. And uh, I think for a time he was uh, Fidel Ca Castro's official legal counsel in the U.S., uh, counsel for the Cuban government. Uh, Victor Rabinowitz, again, uh, you know, he's the guy I interviewed when I started my research in the Rosenberg case. Julius Rosenberg had gone to Victor Rabinowitz to be his first lawyer before he found Emanuel Block. Victor Rabinowitz could not represent Julius Rosenberg because he was already representing Judith Copeland, a convicted Soviet spy who got off in technical grounds. And Victor Rabinowitz said, this interview is off the record. If you quote me, I'll say, I didn't say this and you're making this up. I'll sue you, I'll do everything possible. But he said, I just want you to know before we start talking that of course the Rosenbergs are guilty. I'm not a fool, I know that. Uh, and uh, Julius came to me, I knew he was a Soviet spy, uh, but you can't say that because I'll deny it. And then he told me various details uh, that I needed for the story. But uh, that's the caliber of these people. And Joni Rabinowitz uh, ended up in Democratic Socialists of America. And the reason she called me after the Rosenberg file came out, she said, I must say I'm thinking of quitting DSA because I'm embarrassed to be in a group with a, like, with a traitor like you. Uh, you are vile. You should never have written this book. You're the scum of the earth. And she went on and on and on. And I let her talk because she was calling long distance. At least I, <laughs> at least I let her have the uh, joy of a big phone bill. <laughs> Stephen, my good friend Stephen yeah, Schwartz. Uh, Inspiring movie about Irving Abrams and Molly Steimer, who was his Jacob comrade. Abrams. Jacob Abrams. I, I'm sorry, and Molly Steimer, called the Yiddish Anarchists of New York. The question I have for you: If a young man or woman, 20 years old, 18, 16, were to come to you and say, "I saw the film about Jacob Abrams and Molly Steimer fighting the police for the workers, carrying the red and black flag of anarchism." and I'm going to be a revolutionary, and I'm going to go just as far as they did. What would you say to that person, knowing what you know? Uh, I would say, hopefully, the times are different. They grew up in a very different time. America was a very different kind of society. That my hope, I knew Jake, I would tell him I knew Jacob Abrams. He was a very open, inspirational, thoughtful person. And I would believe that he too would change and have the courage to abandon some of his own youthful illusions had he lived in the future and to imitate someone uh, because you're inspired by their militancy is not really uh, worthwhile. You'd be wasting your own precious youth. But unfortunately, I the reason I wrote this book is I hope that what the kind of things I do in this book help people understand that kind of thing, and hopefully, maybe, somebody will read it and say, gee, I better think before I take the next foolish step. <laughs> Thank you. Ryan, and thank you, Linda. And um, we, we have a couple of copies of the book left. So if you would like to uh, get your copy autographed, I'm sure Ron will be happy to uh, not only sign books, but, but probably continue telling these great stories. Um, thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you next time. <laughs>